feet. Some nifty moves. How about this run from Granger? He'll have a first down at the zip occurrence. Quick shot left side. There's Malachi McCoy. First guy misses. Second guy misses. Across the 50. Five in the play. He's free. Bye-bye. As they set up for the break, 94 yards and a cloud of dust for Western Kentucky. Dave, a team that won 12 games a year ago, got the Mountain West Championship game. Chance to get off the bat in their season, a conference opener, but it's Genty who slips the tackle, runs up field, fast and Genty! Looking for that end zone, he's got Harvey, and that's a catch for a touchdown! Old Dominion breaks the ice with 7.05 to go here in the fourth, and Javon Harvey hauls in touchdown number two on the year. The G5 Hive. All G5, all the time. Welcome to episode number one of the G5 Hive where we aim to bring you all the honey and goods on that G5 college football. I'm your host, co-host Justice. I'm joined by Luke. Um, I don't know about you, Luke, but I'm super excited for this project. I'm looking forward to doing it with you weekly. You know, what's going on, man? Oh, not a lot. Allergies are kicking my butt tonight. Um, today, it's uh, pollen's pretty high here in Iowa. Um, but, yeah, I'm super excited for this collaboration that, I mean, started as an idea of a project that I wanted to do later, and I was talking to you about some G5 stuff and defensive guys, and then, like, why don't, have you thought about doing a whole podcast about it? I was like, oh, not, not really, and do you want to? <laughs> I mean, why not? Um, you know, we were kind of talking about, all of the college football news that is out there, there's not really a a space that just talks about G5. Granted, all the news is hard to come by, um, but there's nothing that ge- just looks at G5. Everyone kind of looks at everything. So this is kind of a fun opportunity to just kind of focus in on G5 and give, you know, give the G5 a time in the the sunlight, I guess you would say. Sure. I mean, I think the thing that excites me the most is like, it's, it's a, you know, we're going to, because we're focusing only on the G5, right. We'll be able to go deeper than, than, than most places. Um, which is great for me. I, I'm in some pretty big and pretty deep leagues. So, you know, the finding those deep, uh, G5 players really pays off at the end. Um, a funny here's a funny uh a G, g5 player story i was in the i was in a uh 2014 50 man uh roster supplemental draft last week and um nick nick nash was still a quarterback in some of my leagues in um fan tracks but in some leagues they had him listed as a wide receiver and this particular league that the draft was going on he was listed as a quarterback and uh so I asked the commissioner, he's like, well, we just use whatever Fantrax says. So I was like, okay, well, I'll send Fantrax an email, see what they say. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, he's supposed to be a receiver. But basically, since the draft had already started, when they made the switch, it didn't show up that way. So anyway, um, I finally made the pick, and, like, people were kind of upset that I held the draft up for a couple hours, you know, even though I was on the clock and I had the time. They are like, I can't, I can't believe you held the draft up for Nick, Mother F, and Nash. And uh, Saturday, the guy that said that, he made a comment about open foot, insert mouth about Nick Nash. <laughs> so, yeah, those, yeah those, I mean, those no, five guys pay off. I mean, pardon me for always itching my eyes. Like I said, my allergies are, are rough tonight. But that nothing irritates me more than in a draft that you have a long clock whatever it is, six hours, four hours, eight hours, 12 hours, 24, I don't care. And you say I'm on the clock like all the time. Like I get it. Like you get bumped once. Usually like the person gets done with their pick says, you know, Luke, you're on the clock. And then maybe like an hour before 
you know, time runs out. I get those, but like getting it multiple times, like I know I'm working, I've got yeah. something going on. It's like, I understand, but we, there is a time limit for a reason. So let me use it. Yeah. I mean, I generally try to draft pretty fast. Um, but in this particular scenario, I was kind of waiting to hear back from fan tracks. And if, and if they didn't respond back in, in enough time, I would have made my pick, but I felt like, Hey, you know, I got three hours. I'm going to use two hours and 59 minutes if I need to. Um, especially when I, I'm generally picking like in 10 minutes every time. So yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, but fun stuff, fun stuff with the G five. Um, and you know, an, another, I think the, the, the thing I feel like excites me the most, or another thing that excites me a lot about this project is like you said, it, it fills a, uh, you know, a blind spot in the current market or industry today, right. With that, uh, deeper dive G five coverage, totally dedicated to just the G five. Yep. So, uh, let's get started with, uh, the news and notes, what the swarm needs to know. Um, some more news came on to came today, and it seems like this is a constant topic, especially for the power power conferences. But it affects the G five as well, and that's SMU um, possibly moving to the ACC. I saw some more, I saw some more news about that um, earlier today. That was basically talking about the reason why the ACC would be interested in SMU, Cal, and Stanford is because if they drop below a certain number of teams. Assuming, let's say they lose Clemson, Florida State, you know, somebody yep. else, then ESPN can renegotiate their uh, TV contract. And so they don't ever want to be in a position to drop below that. I think the number was like 15 or something. They don't ever want to be in a position to drop below that number um, where they're, you know, getting less money. I mean, their TV deal isn't that great, anyways, but. Is, right. So they don't want to lose what they do. They don't want, yep. And I had heard something that SMU is okay with not taking any of the money for like seven years. And like, I can't imagine doing yeah. a buyout and then waiting seven years to get paid, but Cal SMU's Stanford got some money. The same boat too, I think. Um, or either coming for free or taking a reduced, um, reduced yeah, think, pot. Yeah. I think they were taking a reduced pot and then M or SMU was like, Hey, we're going to flex. We're gonna show our G five uh, power here, and uh, we don't want any money <laughs> for seven do it for free. years. Yeah, so that in was long run. It makes sense, right? Uh, very interesting, and it sounds like that should be. We should have more information on that within the week. Yeah, I would assume yeah, by the end of the, the weekend. They said early this week. They hope they hope they had some answers. So, and I had. Uh, I'm under the impression that they are waiting on one vote. And NC State seems to be that swing vote. So interesting, interesting. Uh, next, talking some uh, depth chart news. Uh, running back Jamari Farrell is listed atop the running back depth chart for Wyoming, ahead of what many people expected to be DQ James. Um, that doesn't really shock me because James had a pretty serious knee injury, as well as I think, you know, pretty like his kneecap as well. And James isn't a very big guy. Um, he's, he's fairly small as far as his weight goes. And so I wasn't overly shocked that someone was ahead of James. I was shocked that it was Farrell. I thought maybe it would have been LJ Richardson. Um, you know, DeWine McNeely is out for the season. Harrison Whaley is supposed to miss the first few weeks. Um, this just kind of seems like to me like a, a, a spot to avoid until Harrison Whaley comes back. Yep. I I would agree. Um, even when Harrison Whaley comes back, I'm not so sure that, you know, coming back from a knee injury, especially if it's ACL, the next thing that typically happens is that there's an injury with a hamstring, and it's usually the – I believe it's the opposite leg. There's a hamstring injury. So usually when there's a knee injury, I just – don't want that player for a couple of years until they're over it. And I mean, Wyoming runs the ball a lot, so there could be some value there, but you know, I'll take my shots somewhere else. Yeah. And I don't, I mean, I don't feel like James, you know, 
the weight coupled with the knee injury is he's not built to you know be a workhorse back. So um, I'll just kind of wait and see uh, when Whaley gets back, I guess. Uh, Brady Hunt, tight end from Miami, Ohio, was recently seen in a walk, walk, walking boot, um, according to Martin uh, Gus Martin, Ball State beat reporter. He said that the star tight end did not practice the other day and was in a walking boot. He also sat out earlier in the week without the boot. Um, and he said that this, he's told that the ank- ankle is structurally okay and that Hunt is considered day-to-day. That could be big news if he's out for Cozy All right? I mean, Hunt and Cozy All kind of that one-two uh, punch there for Miami of Ohio. And it sounds like I would expect him to not play this week. Um, coach came out today and said, you know, we're, we're going to make sure our backups are ready to go. And when you say day-to-day, I mean, it really means week-to-week at this point. It's – I'm just not going to expect Brady Hunt for, for week one. Yep, I, I, I would agree with you there. Uh, Western Kentucky wide receiver Michael Matheson is expected to miss some time games this year. Um, and it's kind of ambiguous. Um they talk about the amount of amount unknown, but it, it, to me, it seemed like it's fairly significant. Um, several games to quite possibly the entire year um, due to an injury that he suffered in fall camp. I couldn't really find anything about the injury, um, but that certainly, I think, in some respects, possibly clears up who the wide receiver two might be there at Western Kentucky um, with Dalvin Smith. Yep. But uh, certainly opens the door of opportunity for some other guys to step up, too. Especially with that cheat code being a tight end and wide yep. receiver in yep. many uh, fan tracks leagues, unless your com- commissioner has said he is a wide receiver or designated him as a tight end. So I, or I would definitely check that. Primary position only league. His primary position is wide receiver, so then he'd only be wide receiver. But yeah, that is that is a a boom for for Western Kentucky here week one. Uh, next up, Isaiah Jacobs, Josh Jacobs' little brother, a uh, transfer from Maryland, is sitting atop the depth chart along with a Jermaine Brown for UAB. And, I mean, I kind of expected that. I didn't know that it would be Jacobs. There's um, another guy there that was a transfer whose name is escaping my head right at the moment, who I thought might be the kind of the one-two punch with Brown. Um I mean, I just don't. I don't think Brown. Like, I don't. If people were expecting Brown to be Dwayne McBride, I don't think that was realistic. I think Brown kind of stays in the role he was in last year, right? And then, you know, they kind of get that that bruiser in there with him. And in this case, it's going to be Isaiah Jacobs. I'm trying to look up the the depth chart here, so I can try to get you that other name. Is it uh, okay? Is it? Oh, I can't think of it now. I want to say it was a JUCO guy um, uh, that that transferred in. Um, uh, it's not. I don't. It's not like Kentrell Bullock. I think he's at South Alabama. Battle. Yes, Demetrius Battle. Demetrius right? Battle. Yep. Yep. That was the other guy. That was the guy I thought maybe would kind of be that one-two punch, but actually fifth on the depth chart. Yeah. So yeah, he's down there. Um, but Jake, also Jermaine Jake Brown. Good. Jermaine Brown also with not an or, so that's a good sign. They're both uh, – both names are are bolded, but uh, yeah. yeah, not an or, so that's nice. Yeah, I mean, and I think, like, Brown, like, if you're – as long as you're not expecting to be Dwayne McBride, I think he's going to do what he did last year, right? Now, I don't – I'm not saying that I think Jacobs is going to be McBride, um, but I think Jacobs is going to be the guy kind of running between the tackles, the goal line work, that kind of stuff. All right, moving on to Connecticut. Uh, Devonta Houston is the top the running back depth chart there and not Victor Rosa. Um, it's a little bit surprising for me. I actually, I would have, if you had asked me like before this news dropped, who I thought would have been number one, my gut instinct would have been Jalen Mitchell, the uh, the transfer from Louisville. But nope, it's Houston. Um, so I, I honestly really thought Victor Rosa did great as a freshman last year. I believe he was like top three, top four freshmen with uh, rushing touchdowns. I think he had 10 last year, if I'm remembering correctly. But 
he was definitely one of the best freshmen in the nation for rushing touchdowns, and he went to UConn. Like, yeah, I'm I'm surprised he didn't get a little bit more uh, respect on his name there. And and but depth charts are depth charts. We'll we'll see what happens when things things start uh, going during the season. Yeah, I mean a lot of the depth charts, right? Uh, I was looking at one today, and it was like every single position was or 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 or. Um, so like, what's yeah. the purpose of doing a depth chart at that point? I mean, that's what you got to do in those Power Five schools like Iowa State. You just never know, you know, who might get caught up in some ring. You don't have to worry about that in the G5. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, sticking with Connecticut, Joe Fagnano was named their starter at quarterback, I think, which is a bit, bit of a surprise. He uh, is a transfer from Maine. Um, so he, he, be, he beat out Ta- Taquan Roberts, Robertson, uh, who was a starter, then got hurt, like I think in game one last year. As well as Zion Turner, who was a true freshman who played for the, you know the rest of the way for him, so that's that was a little bit of a surprise to see him named the starter there. Yeah, and you know something that really UConn hasn't had is a guy who can really chuck the ball around. Yeah, and it looks like Joe can do that. If I am remembering correctly, he had just over two hundred yards passing and two touchdowns. Didn't look too bad, and you know, last year I'm trying to remember who the quarterback was last year, but it was a lot of at Connecticut was Zion Turner. Zion Turner. It was a lot of like throw out to the flats. You know, he was, really, no, Turner was a true freshman, but yeah, not not a lot of you know down the field uh, no. throwing no. there. So this is something that you know, Connecticut. Connecticut could be something I, I don't want to say something to deal with, but like they're they should be a little bit better than they were last year. Yeah, I mean last year I think their 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 mo for winning was run the ball effectively and play great defense, and that's what they did, right? They got to a bowl game, and uh, you know, and so yeah, if they can unlock a passing aspect of that offense, you know, it should only be uh, you know improvement, you know, improvement from there. Uh, next, uh, Malachi Jones, to, to uh, at least my surprise, was not listed on top of the uh, Tulsa depth chart. Um, but the reason being is apparently he had, he's had some kind of injury, um, but he is expected to be back fairly soon. I know I certainly expected that Jones would kind of be the wide receiver one for Tulsa. Um, and uh, maybe uh, game one, it'll be uh, Braylon Presley, who, uh, who will be that guy. But we'll see. Maybe... And again, maybe like Jones is a game time decision. They did put him on the depth chart, but maybe he plays. Yeah, um, yeah, he was way down there on the depth chart. Um, not really sure what's going on, but uh, based off reports out of out of camp, there sounds like it's not anything that's going to hold him back uh, too long. No, and, and he was looking good, right? I mean, most of, like all the reports I saw were talking about him and Nick Rimpert, and Rimpert's not listed as a starter either, so. Um, both of those guys kind of got several positive reports in fall camp, but neither one of them are starters. So hopefully whatever it is, it's like you said, it's minor and, and they'll be back out there soon. Cause the Tulsa wide receiver one can be, you know, a productive, productive spot for your CFF teams. Yeah. Yep. Um, speaking of productive spots on uh, the G five, uh, tight end, um, and Memphis has been one of those places that the tight end has been heavily utilized in the past. And the next man up is Anthony Lanfear. Um, I know many people were, you know, were hoping he was going to be the man last year. Caden Prescorn um, was there and he kind of took over that role and was super productive from the tight end spot. Prescorn's now moved on to Ole Miss and now Lanfear fears the next man up. And I think he's, uh, he's, I feel like he's been overlooked a lot in a lot of leagues and in, if you're a tight end premium league, that could be a mistake. Yeah, I I really like Lame Fear. I think he's just a tall, a solid tight end option. He, let's see here. I got some stats. I I uh, did some work on and put some information out there on my sub stack about this offense. And you know, while tight end or while touchdowns aren't really a sticky stat. We've had three years in a row of seven touchdowns from the Silverfield tight end. So, I mean, 
by NBA Jam rules, the tight end is on fire. Yeah. Like, you, you got to gotta trust the process. So, you know, tight ends are hard to find, so that, that might be a, a guy to look out for. If he's out there on your waivers, just uh, maybe watch list Anthony Lamp- Lampfear. And, 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 you know, I, I don't think Memphis, the wide receivers are, you know, other than maybe Blacumsa, there's not a whole lot there. And so um, that just, again, screams, hey, you know, we're going to continue to utilize the tight end because, you know, we don't have, you know, a staple of stud wide receivers. Um, and uh, a little a little bit of a surprise. Uh, it wasn't totally shocking to me. Um Avery Morrow, running back Colorado State, is now back with the team and eligible to play. So I was in a Mountain West only draft, um, 10 team draft. And as you can imagine, running backs dried up really, really quick. So I was sitting there. I don't know what round it was. Maybe it was like the eighth, ninth, 10th round. And no one had taken Morrow yet. And so I started doing a little digging. And I noticed that. You know, while there had been no announcements, the picture uh, that they used on the roster had been updated for Morrow. And so I kind of took that as, hey, you know, he's coming back. He's coming back, right? Why else would you update this dude's picture on the roster? Um, and so I took a chance and, you know, and, and it, it is, at least worked out from the standpoint that he's, he's, he's on the team eligible play. Whether he'll actually do anything or not, I don't know. I mean, I, I fully expect him to be the starter. I think on the depth chart is listed as an or yep. uh, between him and Kobe Johnson, but Morrow's, John- Morrow's a little bit bigger than Kobe Johnson, right? And I don't know that Kobe is going to. Kobe's listed first, so, again, doesn't really matter if you get the first snap if you only play one snap. so Right. So it, it will be interesting to see kind of how it shakes out uh, between those two. I would say with Morrow coming back, it probably puts a little bit of a hamper on um, Damian Henderson, the true freshman out of California. Yep. Um, because without Moro, maybe he got you know, he got more of an opportunity this year. But with Moro and Kobe there, you know, he's it wouldn't shock me that he's he's destined to be a red shirt this year. Um, so we'll see how that plays out there in uh, in week one. All right, now moving on to uh, the good stuff, the nectar, as we call it. Uh, some week zero takeaways. Um, so we're just kind of kind of run through the the G five teams that played in week zero. Just kind of share our thoughts on those players. Um, first up is Navy. Um, I don't really have too much to say about the game. But they, <laughs> they were thoroughly dominated. Um, the one thing that I'd like I, I'm kind of interested in is if Teddy Gleaton returns to Navy for week one. So Gleaton was you know throughout spring he was the number one quarterback. And then you get into fall camp, and it gets announced that, hey, he had an academic issue, and he's not with the team right now. Um, and so he wasn't, he wasn't, you know, available for week zero, which they knew, um, and the hope was that he would be available for week one. Now, he did miss a lot of practice because basically he had to go to this class, and so he had to go to the class, and if it conflicted with practice time, he had to go to the class. So he only – I think they talked about he only made practice really like on, you know, on the weekend. So um, I'm interested to see, you know, if he, if he can come back and return for Navy um, and, and possibly start for him this year, because the quarterbacks that they marched out there against Notre Dame against they're, they're obviously overmatched, but um, you know, it was kind of more of the same, which what we've seen the last few years in terms of Navy quarterback production. Yeah, and then going on to UTEMP and Jacksonville State. Uh, Justice, you might have to help me with this uh, last name here, but uh, Kelly Akahari. Ak- Akahari. I, I don't know. <laughs> call him Not- Kelly A. We'll call him Kelly A. Uh, routes uh, versus Tyron Smith. So we had, you know, Kelly ha- Kelly A had four receptions on seven targets, while Tyron had five receptions on seven targets. Kelly had 102 yards receiving and one touchdown while Tyron only had 38. So that was kind of a little surprising. So Kelly had uh, 26 snaps 
out wide, five in the slot, and Tyron had 10 out wide with 22 in the slot. And both played about the same number of, of pass plays, so 31 versus 32. Um, anything that really jumps out to you there, Justice? So, um, I mean, the average depth of target for Kelly was 23.7. The average depth of target for Tyron was 6.3. And so I see a lot of people like, and I could be totally wrong about this, but I feel like people are overreacting. Yep. Um, when you, when I went back and like, so last year I, I was pretty high on Kelly A and he had, he had games exactly like this. I don't think he had a hundred yards, but basically his utilization was exactly the same. He's the deep ball guy. Right. Um, and so he'd have a game where he, you know, has good production, and the next game he doesn't do nothing. Um, and similar to Tyron, like Tyron had games that, from a statistical standpoint last year, were very similar to this game. And so I'm not, I mean, I'm not like overly concerned. Um, I don't. Yeah, that's what that's what we got to tell the people because people on this Tyron Smith just roller coaster. So all right, Tyron Smith coming back. Things are going to be great. Okay, no, nope, no, nope. he's going to was it Texas A and M? Yep. Okay, yep. I don't know how he's going to do well there. Oh no, he's coming back to UTEMP. Everything's going to be great, and then we get this week zero game. So, I mean, the, the fear forward. is right. He's coming back to a team that you know he kind of left, and how would he be received? Um, you know, hopefully he came back with a good attitude, humbled himself. You know, say, hey, I screwed up, whatever. Um, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not ready to sit here and say that Kelly A is wide receiver one. Um, just from a pure statistical standpoint, this game for both receivers just kind of really mirrored things we saw last year. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm not ready to anoint Kelly A the man and say, you know, cut your share as a Tyron Smith. That's, I'm not in that boat. Well, something else that was, Interesting uh, with Dion Hankins and his output in this game. So at 15 rushes for 54 yards and touchdown, not kind of was hoping for a little bit more yardage there. Yeah. I mean, he split time. Right. Um, but I, but I also read something recently that maybe he has like a little bit of a nagging injury, so to speak. And so that's that, that could be holding him back. Right. Um, and so, could be the reason why they, they split time. But, I mean, I feel like UTEP is kind of – that's what they do, right? I don't – you know, it seems like at least the last few years anyway, they kind of have a two-back system there. Yep. I mean, he pretty much doubled up uh, Burgess there, uh, 37 snaps to 18. So Snap-wise, he did. Production, they were fairly About identical other than the touchdown. Yep. So something to keep in mind, you know, when you're looking at, at these guys here. Um, Jacksonville State. Uh, they got their first FBS win, right? I mean, that's good. Yep. Um, Rich I, Rod. Yeah, Rich, Rich Rod, Rod back did. in the FBS. Yep. Um, I expected a little bit more out of Zion Webb than what I saw. Um, you know, yeah. he he was okay. Um, well, that was very nice of you, Justice. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I guess. I mean, I don't. I didn't really expect a whole lot passing wise. Um, I think I expected a little bit more rushing wise. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, and, you know, and and the fact that he didn't get a touchdown, so maybe that's gonna be a week to week thing with him. Um, the UTEP defense, UTEP defense is okay. They're not great, um, but you know, it could be you know first game jitters, first FBS game, all those sort of things. Um, I know a lot of people like have added added Zion Webb as a kind of a, a sleeper, right? Just because being in that Rich Rod offense, a rushing quarterback. Um, but you know, if he's not going to, if he can't get, you know, do better passing wise, you're going to need him to do a lot more rushing wise. Um, now, on the positive side, Conference USA is pretty weak, right? And so, definitely put him on your watch list, but you might have to sit and wait for a little bit. I mean, spots that I have them, I'm probably holding them, right? I mean, 
Most most of the leagues I have them, waivers aren't open anyway, and so I can't drop them until after week one. So I'll get another week to kind of see what he does, right? And uh, maybe he'll maybe he'll redeem himself next week. But just like a Rich Rodriguez offense, we had a lot of running. So we had Malik Jackson with 13 carries and Ron Wiggins with 13 carries. Almost uh, pretty much identical stat lines. Uh, yeah. Malik Jackson played uh, 32 snaps while Wiggins played 36. 76 yards rushing versus 63. Both had a touchdown. The only thing that was different was uh, Malik Jackson had 66 yards after contact uh, while w- Wiggins had 26. So, Yeah, and I think Wiggins being in there was a little bit of a surprise. I think most people expected it to be a one-two punch, but I think they expected it to be Malik Jackson and Anwar Lewis. Um, and, you know, and it wasn't. So uh, Wiggins, very possible, you know, in your super deep leagues that he's available. Um, most people, I think, drafted Jackson and Anwar, expecting they were the top two guys. Uh, one thing I did want to mention really, well, before we move on to the next game is uh, UTEP running back transfer Aaron Dumas, um, who transferred in from Washington. Um, like many other second-time transfers, he's waiting on a waiver. Last I heard, he hasn't heard back, and so clearly he's not eligible to play. Um, and I'll be honest with you. If you haven't heard back on a waiver by now, my opinion is you're not likely to get uh, get approval. Um, it's it's very I feel like it's very rare in season that they approve kids waivers. So. That is going to make a lot of uh, P five managers upset. Uh, in Tez football. Well, I guess for Tez Walker, they still got the rest of this week to hear back, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, I just. It, yeah, I feel bad for these kids, right? Because in most cases, I don't think it's in Dumas Dumas's cases, but like in Devontae Walker's case, um, you know, he made this decision and he transferred when the rules were a certain way, and then literally like two weeks later they change them. Yep, so he kind of got caught, you know, um, and you know it sucks. I don't, there's no way around it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you kind of, you kind of would hope maybe the NCAA would um, kind of grandfather kids that had, you know, entered the portal and announced where they were going, based on the previous waiver um, eligibility rules versus now. But you know, that's not how the NCAA works. So anyway, the NCAA doesn't have much power, so they're they're holding on to anything. And honestly, so they do have yeah, that's true. Like. Why even listen to the NCAA? Just do what you're gonna do. Oh, you're not gonna put me in a bowl game? Like that's that's about it, right? The NCAA just pretty much puts on the bowl games. I will say this for Tez Walker owners. I feel like maybe not so much in football, but definitely in basketball, the NCAA treats the power five different than the, than the lower schools, right? With, yep. wa- with waivers. I, I've seen it firsthand where, you know, a, a lower-level school kid doesn't get a waiver, but the kid playing for Carolina or Kentucky gets a waiver, you know, and, and with identical situations. So yeah. um, it wouldn't shock me that if Tez Walker gets approved and none of these uh, G5 kids get, get approved. So, But, Justice, I'm not exactly sure how to follow up Jacksonville State getting their first college FBS win. <laughs> so I guess we just got to do UMass. <laughs> they get their first FBS opening game win since 1984, snapping a 28-game road uh, losing streak, and this is their first win in the home or in an opener uh, since 2018 versus UConn. So, a lot of big things here in UMass. Yeah, I was. Um, I watched a little bit of that game, uh, mostly more the second half, and. Um... I was, I was, I was shocked. Right. I didn't, you know, UMass, like if you had asked me like, who are the worst teams in FBS? I would have said UMass and uh, Florida international like that yep. before week zero. That's who I would have said. So, um, and not that New Mexico state, I think is great. Right. But they did, they did kind of, they did get into a bowl game last year. They kind of sneaked in on a technicality, but Hey, nonetheless, just making the bowl game is great for New Mexico state. Right. Um, 
So I, I, I was a little shocked, a little shocked by that game. Yep, we got Karon Lynch Adams with 14 carries for 75 yards and two touchdowns, 45 of those yards coming after contact. Played 40 of the 54 snaps. So not a high volume offense, but he's the guy running the ball. Yeah. Um, like you said, when I was putting the, the stats together for the, the show sheet, like I was I, I was kind of curious and you know, I, I probably maybe I'll go back and watch the game, like because it seemed like it seemed like UMass must have been super efficient, right? Because the stats don't really kind of kind of lead you to how many points they scored. Um, so, I, you know, without having watched the full game, my guess is they were just super efficient um, on I the mean, offensive end. Tyson Fomachon only threw the ball 17 times yeah. and almost threw it for 200 yards. So, yeah. I mean, he had 10 completions, so not too bad there. Did a lot of his damage there on the ground with 12 attempts for 90 yards and a touchdown. So, yeah. Um, don't know if Fomachon's something that I'm – someone I'm, you know, picking up if because you can, can keep that rushing up maybe, right? I mean, that's kind yeah. of be the key is he's, he's got to kind of repeat that rushing ability on a week-to-week basis. If he can do that, he's probably rosterable, at least in deep leagues. And, again, in deep leagues, you got Diego Pavia, uh, 16 of 27 for 248, three touchdowns, two interceptions, um, and had 20 yards rushing. So a dot of 12.6, so that's not a bad, you know, pushing the ball down the field, um, just about 250 yards passing, not not too bad there for New Mexico State. Again, somebody else that, you know, probably keep an eye on. So um, I feel like a lot of his stats kind of came in garbage time, right? Larry in the fourth in the fourth quarter. Um, but you know, maybe maybe that's maybe you know, first game jitters, whatever the case may be, they've kind of worked that out, and he can he can kind of take that uh, hot fourth quarter and carry that over to next week. Um, Plus, you know, I mean, it's not like you said they got in based off of a technicality. They're, you know, I'm not going to say they're a great um, football program this year, but my favorite point, my favorite part about fantasy football is that garbage points still count. Right. They count just like it. the first point, right? Yeah. Um, yep. Oh, I was, I was super thankful for the garbage time points for Pavia because I had him, I had several um, parlays on prize picks and every single one of them had Pavia. Um, oh. and, and, you know, that garbage time stuff helped me win. I mean, I won a hundred bucks. I turned $15 into a hundred dollars. So, Hey, I, I, I was thankful for garbage time for sure. That reminds um, me, remember, remember that hundred dollars you owe me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, sure I'll, I'll lose it this week on prize picks. <laughs> hopefully it's not as disappointing as Mark Pope was in this game. He only had 15 snaps, which was third among wide receivers. Only two targets, catching one of them for three yards. Yeah, I mean, I it sounds weird, but I kind of had high hopes for Mark Pope, right? Transfer from Miami, uh, transferring down to UMass. I figured, hey, man, maybe he can go there and, you know, be the man for him. And, yeah, he wasn't the man, at least not in week one. Um, yeah, I think I do own him, uh, but it's only in a uh, – um, in a um, conference specific league where UMass was part of the uh part of the player pool um but yeah man I, I I thought when I drafted him I thought I was being smart right I was like man this kid might you know go to UMass and do something well yeah doesn't look that way at least not 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 in week zero yeah that this is the game I had two games I was really excited for this being one of them Ohio playing uh, against San Diego State because I have me some Sam Wiggles uh, shares and, and really excited to see how this game would, would go. I, Ohio brings a lot of veterans back, and I was kind of expecting them to roll, but Roar gets injured pretty early. And I think it's like the third drive of the game and just motionless there for a, a while and Pretty scary stuff, but sounds like 
Um, it was a concussion, and he's on track to play this week, which is odd to me because when you watch NFL games, they talk about concussions being nonlinear and you can have step forwards and back and you've got all this progressions. But I feel like in the college football, it's like, all right, yep, I'll be back next week. And then they usually come back. I don't know uh, how the concussion protocol works here in college, but it sounds like uh, Rorick is on on track to play this week. Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> it's just – I know people were concerned about him coming back, you know, from the injury he suffered late last year. Um, and then he comes back and then kind of gets injured again. Um, so I guess it's positive to see for his owners anyway – that you know he's he's back on track to play this week, but when when it, whenever a concussions involved, man, to me like you can't you can't really rush those things. I mean, you could you you saw last year with uh, with Tua, right? What can happen um, yeah. when, when those things uh, you know kind of happen back to back? And to me, like it's just nothing to really mess around or play with, you know, because you know it, it could kill you, you know. Among among other things too, but it just yeah, I mean it's it's kind of kind of scary to think that, and like you said, hopefully their protocols. You look at the NFL, right? Who probably has the most stringent protocols of anywhere, and like in my opinion, they failed Tua. Um, and so, you know, in college, I would expect that their protocols aren't nearly as stringent. And you know, I don't know, concerning, I guess. The big takeaway from this game is you pretty much got, for the most part, an entire game without Rorick as quarterback. And Sam Wiggles seemed to be quarterback proof, getting 10 receptions on 15 targets for 103 yards. Um, out there for every you know passing play. He was out there for um, 84 total snaps and ran 61 of 61 routes. From the slot. Yep. Yeah. So a dot was great at eleven point three. That's that's awesome, and his yak per reception was one point nine. So I mean, it's not like he's creating a lot of extra yards, but but he's getting those yards from the, you know initially getting the chunk yards, getting that separation. Yep. So and then Bangura uh, had fifteen carries for sixty five yards. He played 67 of the 87 snaps. Um, but if Rourke isn't able to go, Bangura is going to be the guy. If Rourke comes back, Bangura is still the guy. So that gives us some uh, people who are in on Ohio. I think I think you're good. And come action time, Ohio is going to roll. And the San Diego State defense is, is a is for a you know a G five is a very solid <laughs> excuse me a very solid defense. So I wouldn't be you know too concerned about Bangura's numbers. Um, that that is a good day I feel like against the San Diego State defense. The um, little egg on my face for this one. So Mark Redman, I, I owned him in two leagues, one of them which was a tight end premium, and I dropped him a couple of weeks ago. Um, so yeah, I'm a little bummed. <laughs> well, what what Mark Redmond do this game? He uh, he was five catches, uh, 62 yards, two touchdowns. Oh, um, that's uh, that's pretty phenomenal for a tight end, right? Yeah. Um, he was out there for he played you know 15 from the slot, four out wide, 10 in line. Uh, he had three. He was out there three three pass blocks, three rush blocks. 60 total snaps, um, a dot of 13 yards after the catch per reception of 2.48, all, you know, for a tight end, man, that was, that was great numbers. And, um, San Diego state doesn't really necessarily have like a true wide receiver one. I don't think, uh, but Redman looks like the guy, right. And probably the guy in the red zone too, with that size. So, so with, with those two touchdowns, he had four of his targets were in the end zone. So they're looking for him down there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Like I said, 
Shame on me for dropping them a couple of weeks ago, especially in that tight end premium league. I actually submitted a waiver, um, and you know, to try and buy them back for a bid. I, <laughs> I don't think it's processed yet, so I, I don't know if I got yeah. them, man. But yeah, yeah nothing burns me. Nothing burns me up more than having to spend money on someone I just freaking dropped. Yeah, <laughs> but it happens, the, right? It happens to all of us. Yep. The game that I was really excited for was Hawaii. You got the run and shoot offense coming back, right? So run and shoot. I know there's different variations. I think it was considered that. But you've got Shager with 35 pass attempts. So, and they scored 28 points. So if you're scoring in that 30, 35 range and throwing it 35 times, that's going to be a lot of volume for your receivers and your quarterback from a fantasy football standpoint. So you had 350 yards passing, three touchdowns, two interceptions, eight out of 10.8. And Justice, I'm going to let you take it away here with the wide receivers. Yeah, so um, fortunately for me, a positive of last week, I had a lot of shares of Ashlock, um, and, yeah. I got, and I got him virtually free. Um, I think there's only like three leagues I didn't add him. Um, and then, so I had to bid on him this week. Of course, I didn't get him free this week. Um, but, you know, I did get quite a few free shares of Ashlock last week. So, you know, the fantasy gods giveth with Ashlock and they take away with Redmond. That's just how it works sometimes, right? But uh, it was really a kind of a tale of two halves. Like Stephen McBride was the man in the first half. Uh, Ashlock, Pafali Ashlock was the man in the second half. Um and, and I, I see this, I, I've seen this debate, I guess, quite a bit, you know, after the game is, well, who do we add, McBride or Ashlock? Um, I'll tell you who I want. I want Ashlock. He's yeah, in the slot. 100%. And he's a freshman. 100%. I want Ashlock. Like you said, he is in the slot. Typically, the slot receivers are the ones to target in the run and shoot. And that doesn't mean that the, the boundary guys or out wide guys can't be productive. They can. Yep. Um, but, you know. The consistency is seems to be more so there with um, with the guys in the slot. But you know, again, they both produce McBride, um, seven catches on nine targets, ninety eight yards, two touchdowns. Like we said, uh, most all of his, all of his snaps were out wide. He was in on fifty six of sixty two total snaps. He had an A dot of fourteen point eight uh, yards after catch per reception of three point four, and literally like. Ashlock stats are almost identical. Yep. Um, Ashlock, perfect. Seven for seven. He caught all seven targets, 127 yards, one touchdown. He did have two touchdowns that were like reversed, if you will, um, called back, whatever you want to call it. Um, so he he very easily could have had three touchdowns in this game. Um, the, the other thing here is if you just like take a step back, this was great from a Hawaii standpoint. They got shellacked last year, like sixty-three to seven, yeah. or something like it was a shellacking yes, last yes, year. Yes, and that was at home. Hawaii makes that trip to Vandy and puts up a, you know, they're p- probably staying in the hotel that's right next to the stadium that's getting construction on. You know, they're probably out there working on it at night, just jackhammers, so they don't can't sleep all night. And performed really well and had a chance to to win this game late. Um, wheels up for Hawaii, you know. Yes, they got Stanford uh, next week. And when you're in the Mountain West, if this is what you can do to quote unquote an SEC defense, um, I'm excited to see what they do against Stanford. Probably, you know, not that much of a tougher tougher test but yeah i'd say probably even up. lesser at least from a defensive standpoint wheels up for this during conference play i'm excited to see it and i think yeah. you want all pieces of this offense with the exception of tylen hines i i don't know you tell me justice i i was excited a lot of reports that he was running out of the slot he might be that guy you got a lot of running backs that go down, get hurt with a knee injury, so you're down to two two running backs. I think they even brought a linebacker in to be uh, 
a third string running back. What are your thoughts here? So I know a lot of people are like super like concerned about Tylen Hines um, and like ready to jump ship. Um, I, do I have some concerns? I do, but I'm not concerned from a rushing standpoint. Uh, Vanderbilt's a decent defense, right? Uh, people always think, well, Vanderbilt sucks. Well, they suck by SEC standards, right? But compared to the rest of the the rest of the conferences, they're not a, they're not from a talent standpoint, they're not a terrible team. You know, they, they kind of always recruit, you know, in that top 35, top 40 range. And so they have the talent. They just don't have the 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 the, the talent the rest of the SEC does. So um, I was not I'm not overly concerned about his rushing numbers. What I am concerned about is that his lack of usage in the passing game, um, because I feel like Hines is probably one of their better playmakers. And I would have liked to see him, you know, them be able to get him. You know, he, obviously rushing wasn't working in the game. I don't feel like rushing was working for Vanderbilt either, right? Um, but, you know, so you, you, instead of just, like, letting that neutralize Hines, I would like to see them, like, get him the ball, you know, through the passing game and, you know, and, and let him make some plays in the open space. And, and that just didn't happen. Um, he played 26 snaps versus the 24 snaps for the backup Landon Sims. Um he ended up with nine rushes for 15 yards. Um, all 15 of those yards came after contact, right? So that just kind of tells you, like, hey, the defense was in the backfield right on top of him the entire time. Um, in the passing game, he only had one target, which he did catch for three yards. Um, he was in there for 15 pass snaps. He did run the run a route eight times. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I am a little bit concerned because I thought the value – the value I was only in on Hines really for PPR leagues, yeah, um, and 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 that's kind of where I thought he'd add the value that he wasn't going to get from a rushing perspective, um, and so yeah, I, I am a little bit concerned, right? But uh, Vanderbilt again, like I said, is a solid defense. Um, it is SEC school, and um, I th- I thought I thought Hawaii looked light years better than they did last year. I remember. Last year, when you know Timmy Chang was the new coach, I was all in on Hawaii, man. I was drafting Shager, I was drafting uh, Pinoke. Um, who's the other kid that was the, the that was there last year? The uh, Zion Bowens. You know, I was scooping those guys all up, and you know, I was I was I was a year ahead of schedule, I guess. Um, yeah, at least on Shager, anyway, and. Uh, yeah, just uh, well. Hopefully, you kept him. Otherwise, you have to spend more money to pick. Well, him up. so in most leagues, I did. Here's an interesting thing: there is one league where I actually have I drafted him twice in a supplemental. I drafted him last year in a supplemental, and then yeah. I drafted him again this year in the supplemental. So, um, yeah, kind of a little interesting fact there. Um, but yeah, the the last year the offensive line for Hawaii was terrible, um, and you know whether they wanted to. You know, passed the ball a ton last year. They just didn't have time, right? I mean, someone was in the quarterback's face, like, you know, straight away. Quick. Yeah. And so it seems like, you know, if they can do this against the Vanderbilt defense, I'm, I'm excited to see what they're going to do against the Mountain West. And with that system, they're usually, you know, looking at that slot. But I'm curious if when they play lines that aren't as good, if that – means you're going to have bigger games on the outside versus the inside. Because obviously if you got don't have a lot of time, you're going to, you know, first read. And and then there you're looking at right at that slot there. So I'm well, but, but if you look at McBride and Ashlock's like depth of targets, they're very similar, right? Yep. I mean, they're almost identical. So it wasn't like um, it wasn't like a game we're going to talk about here in a little bit, Louisiana Tech, where one guy, the slot guys catching a one yard pass, and then, you know, running all over the place and the outside guys going deep. Both of these guys were, you know, running well past the line of scrimmage on their catches. So I don't know well, that, you know, that would concern me too much, but it'd be good for Tylen Hines, right, for his rushing. Yep. Well, I mean, you alluded to it. So let's um, let's skip to the FIU La Tech game where Lawrence had fifth – Teen rushes for 139 yards and one touchdown. 
116 of those yards came after contact, and I uh, played 31 of 46 snaps. So not a lot of uh, plays ran in this one. In general, FIU just did not look good. No, I mean they outside of Shamari Lawrence, they they looked uh, they looked terrible. And uh, you know while I, I'm encouraged by Shamari's performance, um, I don't know that's sustainable, right? I mean if if your if your passing offense can't get more than six yards in a game, right? The 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 uh, <laughs> oh man, you know the um, running back's not going to find a lot of room. Yeah. The uh, and and this stat line like reminds you a lot of like what you kind of saw last year, right? With uh, um, Lexington Joseph, right? I mean, he'd have games like this, and, and, and you know, with 15 carries, 100 plus yards, and a touchdown. But then the next game, he has 15 carries and you know, 40 yards and no touchdowns. So, um, someone I mean, to watch, but yeah. unless no you're in a I super really deep league, he's worth a shot, right? Yeah, no one I really want to pick up here. Uh, and then we got Hank Bachmeyer uh, transfer in from another G5 powerhouse, Boise State. Uh, 45 pass attempts, completed 34 of them for 332 yards, one touchdown, one interception, and eight out of 4.7. Yikes. Uh, not not all that great, but you can see it there with uh, the receivers. <laughs> you want to talk a little bit about the receivers? Yeah, so um, another kind of highly, I think, debated topic preseason was who's the man, Smoke Harris or Cyrus Allen? Um, Smoke, Harris from, Smoke Harris, from a statistical standpoint, right, looked great. But, um, I, I, I mean, you got to dig deep. You got to dig deep. If you look deeper at the stats, I think you'll see that, hey, um, Florida International just can't tackle worth the crap. Uh, yep. So Smoke Harris uh, – Caught all 11 of his targets for 154 yards, a touchdown. Primarily, he was in the slot, uh, 38 slot snaps, one out wide. Um, But his average depth of target was 1.8 yards. Now, conversely, his yards after the catch per reception was 12.2. Awesome, right? Um, And, you know, what? again, I caught some of this game at the end. And, like... I can't tell you how many missed tackles Florida International had on Smoke Harris. It was like, it was it looked ridiculous. Um, and so, I don't know if you're expecting him to, you know, have an A dot of less than two yards and get a hundred yards every week. That's that's not something that I'm willing to bet on, right? Um, and not sustainable, as as opposed <laughs> to Cyrus Allen, who had about half the the receptions with five. Um, five to seven for 48 yards. Uh, his yards uh, per or his yak uh, per reception was 2.6. So he's getting the separation and then not getting away. Right. Um, but his average depth of target was 11.3 yards. Yep. So I think trust the process. Stick with uh, Cyrus Allen. Um, I mean, if you have the R league, it's going to be hard to not start smoke just because he's going to get so much volume, but you, you can't count on a hundred, a hundred plus yards and a touchdown every week. I don't think not with the two yard a dot. <laughs> yeah. And then as a tight end, Nate Jones, if you're in tight end premium, nine targets, seven receptions, granted 28 yards. Yeah. He had another really low a dot, which all, you know, all these things kind of lead to the low a dot for Hank, like you said. So, Again, tight ends are hard to come by. If you're getting nine targets, and yeah, you're in a great. And if you're even if you're in a PPR league, seven points just off of receptions. Right. He only good. had 28 yards, but he got you 9.8 points and and a one PPR league. So so someone to maybe just watch there um, in the queues. He was out there uh, 24 slot. Um, routes so not too bad and he was out there blocking too he had 14 he was in 14 run blocks four pass blocks eight times in line so it's not like he's strictly a um a tight end and name only so to speak you know or title only he, he he does he does block as well so yeah so expect your up and downs this uh maybe more of an up game weird to say with 28 yards 
Yeah, I mean, and they didn't score a ton either, right? I mean, they, they, I mean, the messed up thing is FIU is winning the game with six yards passing until the very end. You know, it was 17, yep. what, 17, 16, I think is what it was, something like that. Um, yeah, so, yeah, FIU is bad, um, really, really bad. They are probably the worst team in uh, FBS. Well, the last game of, you know, week zero, we had USC versus San Jose State. What do you want to highlight here, Justice? Uh, Nick Nash, right? Nick Nick MF Nash, as, as, as my <laughs> uh, co-owner kind of put it. Um, you know, Justin Lockhart is out. Um, he's injured. His arm's in a cast. Um, I can't find anything about what's wrong with his arm other than, you know, he's been seen in a cast. Um or when he's expected back. Um, and so people might be wondering, like, how is that going to affect Nash? Well, I mean, it's, it's very possible that Nick Nash moves into that Cook's role and Lockhart just kind of stays in the role he stayed in last year. Um, I think Charles Ross is solidified in his role as the slot receiver. Um, and I do think Nash is solidified as one of the outside, outside guys. Um, Nash caught six of eight targets for 89 yards, three touchdowns. Again, most of his snaps were out wide, 47 versus three slot. Um, he played 69 total snaps. He had an average depth of target of 14.3 uh, yards, and his yak per reception was 3.2. Ross um, stat line, other than the TDs, was very similar. Uh, five of seven targets, uh, 62 yards, no touchdowns. But again, majority of his work is done in the slot, 29 slot versus 14 on the boundary. Uh, average depth of target, 13.4, and the same exact uh, yak per reception as Nash with 3.2. Um, I would expect that Nash is available in most of your leagues, and you know if you're looking for wide receiver help, um, I'd go snatch him up for sure. Um, he, he's, you know, he, he's definitely you know a bigger guy, red zone target. Um, Cordero likes him. Uh, yeah, I mean, if he can, if he can, you know, get 80% of Cooks, that's a win, I think, right? Yep. And then we'll see what happens when Lockhart comes back, you know. Um, now that Nash performs so well, maybe they're going to take take their time with Lockhart coming back from injury. Who knows, right? So that does it with our Week 0 recap. What are you looking forward to in uh, Week 1 here as we get a lot more G5 teams out there? I think mostly just kind of like how, you know, camp battles and position battles sh shape up, right? Um, probably a top one for me um, is South Florida quarterback situation, right? I think most people feel like Byron Brown is the more talented individual, but, you know, Jerry Bohannon is, is you know, the elder statesman, so to speak. He's the guy that went to media days. Um, he's kind of the, the, the face of the program, if you will. Um, so I'm very interested to kind of see how that shakes out, um, especially with uh, with Alex Golesh, the new the new head coach coming over um, and running that Tennessee offense there. That quarterback spot could be a very, um, very lucrative spot for you for uh, college fantasy football. Yeah. And Byron Brown. So so little interesting uh, thing here. So I want to play a quick game with you here, Justice. All right. Blind resume, player A or player B. Okay. So two game sample size because that's what Byron Brown pretty much had last year. So player A, game one, he was 9 of 20 for 100 yards passing through an INT but had 106 yards rushing in a touchdown. That was good for 18.6 fantasy points. Game two, 17 to 27 for 168 yards passing, one touchdown, two interceptions, 16 yards on the ground with one touchdown, good for 16.32 fantasy points. Player B, game one, 21 of 25, 240 yards passing, three touchdowns, zero interceptions, while adding 76 yards on the ground and one touchdown, good for 44 fantasy points in a six-point passing touchdown league. Uh, game two, 13 of 20, 140 yards passing, 
one touchdown, one interception, 109 yards rushing, and two on the ground. Good for 32.5. I mean, which one do you want? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I know who is who. Um, I mean, based on stats alone, right, you want you want the second player there, but I'm pretty sure in that scenario, the second player is Jerry Bohannon, and the first player is Byron Brown. Am I right? <laughs> no. No? Byron Brown is player B. Player oh. A is Lamar Jackson and his first oh, two okay. starts. Wow. I mean, who do you want? <laughs> Obviously, you don't want Lamar Jackson. I mean, Jerry Bo- or you got yeah. Byron Brown way better than uh, Lamar Jackson here. Yeah, so, I mean – so player eight, so player A was Lamar Jackson, and those oh, stats wow. are from 2015. Game one was against Auburn, who had the 54th ranked defense in the nation, allowing 26 points per game. And game two was against Houston, and Houston was the second or the 20th best defense in the nation, and then letting up 20.7. Um, while Byron Brown's game were uh, against. Tulsa, who's the 117th best defense in the nation, giving up 33.1. And game two is UCF, which was the 46th best defense in the nation, giving up 23.6. So, I mean, context matters. But, hey, he's yeah. electric. Yeah, he is. He is. I mean, yeah. I, I, my fantasy team certainly hope is Byron Brown and not Jerry Bohannon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, it seems like yeah, Bohannon. You're not going to lose this um, your job due to injury, and it looks like he's going to come out there. But with a new head coach, I wonder how long. At some point, you got to figure out. You got to take that Ferrari out for a drive. Right. Yep. Yep. That Lincoln Town car will get you from point A to point B, but it's not. It's not as sexy, right? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> And then we got the SMU wide receiver situation. Um, definitely going to want a piece of that room, but but what are you? Who are you uh, keying in on there at SMU? I, I don't know that I'm really keying in on anybody. I guess if I mean from a dynasty perspective, probably Jordan Hudson. Um, in a redraft, I just kind of avoided the wide receivers, and I was all in on Preston Stone. Preston Stone. Um, well, I know most people expect Curly to be the wide receiver one. I just feel like there's a lot of talent there, and I just don't know that, like, Curly is going to be Rasheed Rice, right? I don't know that that's what's going to happen. Um, Jake Bailey. Jake Bailey was someone I was drafting super late last year. You know, all reports were he looked great. Um, and then he got injured, didn't play. Um, and, and the same thing this year. Like, he looks great as well. And so – uh, plus, they have R.J. Maryland at tight end. I don't know. I ju- it just kind of feels like to me like this is a situation where, you know, there's going to be guys that are productive, right? But considering the draft capital you had to spend to get Jordan Curley, yeah. um, I was kind of out on him just because I felt like it was a little rich for, for me um, compared to other players that I could get kind of in that same spot, like a Jamari Thrash, right? I'd rather have Jamari Thrash than Jordan Curley every day of the week. Um, and maybe I'll eat those words, but um, those were, you know, Jamal Banks. Those are the kind of guys I feel like you were looking at, right? And, um, yeah, I, I'd rather I'd rather have uh, those guys than Curley. Just, I just felt like his, you know, his draft capital was a little too rich for me. But, you know, Jordan Hudson, I think, from a talent standpoint, is the most talented guy there, right? Um, so I'm just kind of interested to see how Bailey and, and Curley and, and Hudson all kind of look, even R.J. Maryland and, and obviously Preston Stone. Then we got North Texas QB situation between Stone Earl and Chandler Rogers. Uh, new coach. Is he is he the one that came from? Uh, Eric Morris, uh, the former offensive coordinator at Washington State, Washington and State. F- formerly of Incarnate Word yep. uh, before he went to Washington State. Yeah. In, in this situation, like I've even heard like they're going to play three quarterbacks. They're going to play Stone Earl, Chandler Rogers, and Jace Ruder. Um, and, and, you know, what I was reading today is they basically talked about all three guys kind of have their – things they do best right and so 
I guess, you know, and so instead of naming one, they're going to let all three kind of do their thing. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> if, if one guy kind of seizes that room, it can be productive, right, from a, from a, a CFF standpoint. But, man, this just kind of, I don't know. You have two quarterbacks, you have none. You have three quarterbacks, you have none. It's none. Kinda, yeah. It kind of seems like a situation where, um, you know, no one has really stood out, and it could be a rotation. And, and then so, we get oh, I was go say, ahead. maybe maybe you look more like at the receivers, right? Like a Jamori Macklin, Macklin, um, or a Roderick Burns or Trey Cleveland who transferred over from Texas Tech. Maybe you kind of look at those guys um, more as an option if you want to piece that North Texas offense. And then UTSA, you know, I think there's a lot of things to look at here. We got Frank Harris, who, you know, talked about his knee injury and just giving up on football, possibly. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got the health check of uh, Clark and Cephas, who Clark is supposed to be a game time decision, according to uh, Coach Jeff Taylor. So I'm kind of curious if UTSA looks the same. I'm hoping yeah, they do. Well, they, lost, they lost their offensive coordinator, right, to uh, to Oregon. So. Yeah, I mean, they, they're a team that seems like all their stars had some sort of injury in the offseason, right? Frank Harris, Kavorian Barnes, uh, Clark, and Cephas. And um, kind of interesting to see interesting to see how that wide receiver room shakes out. Looks like right now Chris Carpenter is that wide receiver three. Um, but, you know, some people were saying Willie McCoy uh, was injured in camp, and so that could play the part of why Kent Carpenter was named the – the starter on the depth chart, but it could be right. Like where Cephas doesn't play or Clark doesn't play. And so, you know, McCoy steps into that spot. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention here is David Amador, a true freshman. Um, if you're in a dynasty league, like you need to add him. He, uh, he's second on the depth chart. And again, maybe he sees some time with uh, the injury questions of Clark and Cephas. So, David Amador, if he's available in your leagues, um, definitely something you know from a from a dynasty perspective that I'd be interested in adding. And then we kind of touched on it there at the beginning, but Western Kentucky's wide receiver situation after Malachi Corley, trying to see how that breaks out. Dalvin Smith, um, Blue Smith, another one transfer um, that you know I've heard a little bit good things about, uh, you know, but kind of see who, who those number two and number three receivers end up being for Western Kentucky. Jimmy Holiday transferred there from Tennessee. Um, I What I've heard is he's an attitude problem, or he was an attitude problem at Tennessee. Maybe he fixes that at Western Kentucky. Who knows? So, yeah. Well, probably um, not. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of times, you know, that that that, that, that doesn't happen. Uh, you know, I was I, I did uh, my Debbie IDP Grind podcast earlier today and talked about Smoke Bowie a cornerback who was at Texas A&M basically got kicked out of Texas A&M, went to Georgia. He's already got dismissed from Georgia, you know, and he's, you know, been in college literally one year and is already on his third school. And so that's not a generally not a good sign, right? Sometimes those guys don't learn their lesson. Then uh, Liberty, we got a new head coach. We've got Jimmy Chadwell makes his way from coastal Carolina over to Liberty. So what happens there with the QB situation between Salter and Bennett? Um, just kind of for six years of Jamie Chadwell's play calling career, his quarterback averages in a six point passing touchdown league uh, 24.51 points. So you're definitely going to have a quarterback that is usable week to week. Uh, probably won't lose you weeks, probably won't really win you weeks either. It's just going to be that steady Eddie there from the quarterback situation. Um, I would assume, I guess I haven't seen the uh, depth chart. Is is Salter? I have li- not seen a depth chart yet for Liberty. Um, I, I, yeah, I hadn't seen one, but I, w- I would assume it's going to be Salter? Question mark? I mean, I think everyone I'm hopes it will right. be, right? I think from a fantasy perspective, his outlook is higher than Bennett's. Um and I'd be more excited if it is Salter than Bennett. Um, you know, selfishly, I do own a few shares of Salter in some dynasty leagues. 
So certainly from that perspective, I do hope it's Salter, but um, I just think Salter has a higher upside than Bennett. But so it, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Then we've got Central Michigan quarterback situation, Bertie Manuel versus Jace Bauer. Uh, based off what I have been privy to, it sounds like uh, Jace Bauer is going to start, um, and there'll be some packages there for Bert Emanuel, which he probably won't be playing, uh, throwing the ball a lot. Yeah, I mean, like last year, did he, I don't think he even attempted a pass, right? He did all his damage rushing. Um, I think he had six passes in like three games. So he did pass a lot yeah. for sure. Um, <laughs> If, if, if they're going to start Bauer, I, I would almost like to see them, you know, move Emmanuel to running back, right, and, and put yeah. him there. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I, this situation, again, just kind of looks to me like it could be a rotation, right? They start off with Bauer, and then maybe things don't go as planned, and then by the time Mac rolls around, they roll Bird out there, and he's rushing for 250, 300 yards a game, and – passing it twice again, you know, who knows? Um, I I wish, I wish there was a clear cut answer here because I can't tell you how many rosters I have both Emmanuel and Bauer. Right. And so I'm essentially eating up, you know, two spots, two spots when it's really, really one. Right. And I hate to do that, but in this situation, I think because of the potential rushing upside, it's just kind of what you have to do. Um, and so I, you know, I'm. I, I almost rather like it's rather Bert Emanuel be the starter, and then him get pulled, than vice versa. Because I, I would feel, I would feel much better about Jace Bauer moving forward if Bert kind of started off and got yanked, versus if Jace starting, um, and then them going. It seems like they could maybe go back and forth between the two. I don't know. It's just kind of my gut feeling there. I did a little bit of digging on the Liberty depth chart. There was, uh, thanks to a sea of red, um, their projected depth chart is Bennett or Salter. And Chadwell had joked that the announcement for the starter would not be made until 15 minutes prior to kickoff. Yeah. Which I don't know <laughs> if it's really a joke. It's probably something that probably. a college coach. Oh, yeah. Oh, so. yeah. I mean, uh, we'll we'll talk about ODU in a second, but that's that's that was so much Ricky Ronnie's mo. So I was a little shocked when he announced Grant Wilson would be the starting quarterback several weeks in advance. And something I think we're all looking forward to: Texas State quarterback battle, Malik Hornsby versus uh, T.J. Finley. Everybody super excited about Malik Hornsby, and then in comes T.J. Finley. Um, sounds like. TJ Finley pulled ahead and then Malik Cornsby came back. So I think this is a, a real uh, a real competition that I, I am for sure excited to see. I own me some uh, TJ Finley shares in some leagues. No Malik Cornsby. Um, yeah, I think I own one share of Malik and it was like it was in a best ball league and I and like he had just I it's a one quarterback league and I already had Donovan Smith and Preston Stone. So I was like what the heck, you know, I, I should, I'll take a shot on Hornsby's upside. Um, yeah, and, and they've released a depth chart, and it's an or. It's Malik Hornsby or T.J. Finley. Um, uh, I, I do believe T.J. Finley's is first. Is so on, that top, means, on top of the or. Yep, so that mean, I mean, that means everything. <laughs> right. Um, not that F comes before H or anything. I'm not looking at any of that. Whatever fits my narrative. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. I, I feel like either one of these guys, if they can like take the, take the bull by the horn, so to speak, that they can be productive in this GJ Kenny offense. Right. I think Hornsby's, you know, from a fantasy perspective, uh, we're more enamored with him because of the mobility and the rushing. Right. Um, whereas Finley's not really going to give you any rushing stats. This is all going to be passing. Um, yeah. Uh, and the thing here with Texas state is again, we talked about incarnate ward well the guy who took over incarnate ward after uh the washington Morris. um so he's now over at texas state yeah so and, and gj kenny did way more at incarnate word you know than eric morris did so 
I'm actually more excited by G.J. Kenny higher than I am the Eric Morris higher. But, yeah. And if they're going to be throwing the ball a lot, that means uh, some wide receivers should be catching the ball. So kind of curious on who comes out on top and if there's maybe multiple assets there in the wide receiver room. Yeah, and again, on that depth chart, the I believe literally the only receiver that did not have an or was Ashton Hawkins. Um, every other receiver spot had an or. And so how that's going to shake out, I don't know. You know, Joey Har- Hobart's there. Joey Hobart is uh, formerly of Washington State. Um, and then he transferred to the FCS, was the FCS All-American. Now he's at uh, Texas State. Bo Corrales is there. Uh, he's a transfer from Carolina. Uh, Shadid Amid is there, transfer from Marshall. Uh, Cole Wilson transferred um, over uh, with the coaching staff. Um, Drew Donnelly. Oh, uh, the Julian Ortega Jones, I think. Yeah, it's just, I don't know. Outside of Ashton Hawkins, it's a mess, right? And so yep. hopefully we'll get some clarity there uh, week one. And then uh, Coastal Carolina talked about uh, Jimmy Chadwell going over to Liberty. Well, that means insert Coastal Carolina head coach. So we've got a new head coach and a new OC there. We've got Tim Beck, uh, head coach, and Travis Trickett coming in to Coastal Carolina. Who's going to call plays? I haven't heard anything as to whether it's going to be more of Tim Beck or more of Trickett. Have you heard anything, Justice? I have not. I have not. Um, and, you know, I, I I just really don't know what to expect. I mean, I think just simply because of Grayson McCall that they can be productive this year. Um, but, I agree. well, and, and McCall does technically have two years of eligibility left. So I think as long as McCall stays, I can see them being, a, you know, the offense being productive. Um, once McCall's gone, I, I'm, I'm, I am concerned, right? Yes, um, for sure. But they got playmakers. You know, they got playmakers a receiver with Sam Pinckney and uh, Jared Brown, right? Jared Brown is electric. Um, and then running back, like, you know, Braden Bennett returns, um, C.J. Beasley. Um, who, who's the third guy that I'm trying to – It won't matter. I'll, I'll just <laughs> let you know it won't matter. Um but anyway, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, they, they have talent on offense, right? Now, defense is another story. Their defense is bad. Um, and they lost their top defender and Josiah, Josiah Stewart to uh, Michigan, transferred there. Um, and so, I guess from a positive standpoint, if the defense is bad, that means the offense is probably going to have to score a lot. And so, you know, so, that, that's, that's good news for McCall and, McCall and company. So, I did a little bit of digging in on, on both of these play callers. So, again, just for fantasy purposes, um, looking at this, the quarterback's going to do better under Beck's system than Trickett's system. Uh, Beck's system in a six-point passing touchdown league, quarterback averages 25.3 points per game versus 19.71. Beck usually has used a mobile quarterback, uh, while Trickett's is more of a functional rushing quarterback. So... Kind of leads me to believe, based off of McCall, that it's going to be a Tim Beck or at least a lot more of his fingerprints on that offense. Both have utilized a workhorse running back approach. Um, Beck's running backs average 16.1 points per game and 17 touches a game, while Trickett's running backs average 16.35 points per game and 16 touches a game. So they're going to be volume pigs um to be completely honest there so uh probably good there for bennett both systems only supported one wide receiver um they're both pretty much the same so you got beck's wide receiver one has averaged 60 receptions versus trickets 63 835 yards versus 817 and then 6.6 6.6 touchdowns versus 4.25. Um, so your wide receiver one for Beck's offense is uh, 14.21 points. Um, and then uh, Trickett's is pretty similar to that. So 
You're only going to be able to support one wide receiver. If you're going to go, which if it's one, who do you think it is? Pinkney or Brown? Give me a second here. I got to scroll while you're, down. while you're doing that, I'll give you my thoughts. I, I would probably lean Brown just because I feel like he's the more dynamic playmaker. Um, but you know, Pinkney might be the better traditional receiver, so to speak. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I guess oh. if you, I, I'd probably pick Brown if I had to pick one. If I had to pick one, I'd pick Pickney. And why do I say that? Is because both wide receiver ones from both of these systems come from the X. And Pickney is going to be in that X position there. Gotcha. Um, so I would expect him to get those 14 to 15 points per game this year. The, the thing that is interesting – about Brown, you mentioned how he's kind of he's kind of like a Swiss Army knife. Yeah. Um, and one of these coaches used to coach at Ohio State, and that was uh, I believe that was uh, Tim Beck. So he had utilized um, Curtis Samuel in the rushing game, in the passing game, like. Used them all over. Like, I can see them use same concepts from that 2016 Ohio State team. I mean, not saying he's Curtis Samuel, but just in right, the usage right. of like concepts and and things to try to do there. Because I mean, he ran a lot out of the backfield last year, or more than you would think a wide receiver should. Yeah, for sure. Yep. All so. Right. Can JMU repeat last year's success? I don't know if they're able to win the conference. This they're, not el- they're not eligible to win the conference again. No, they're so not. They, so I mean, because they would have probably won it last year. I'm they would have to... won the conference last year. They would. Oh. They they won the East for sure. Um, and but they obviously didn't get to play in the championship game. But yeah, yeah, I think they would have won it last year. Um, I think. They're going to be hard pressed to repeat last year's success. Um, you know, Todd Santea was lights out for them. Yep. I don't know that uh, Jordan McLeod or Alonzo uh, Barnett, that either one of them can, you know, produce a Todd Santeo type year. Um, and there's pretty much only one player that I've been on or been in on on the offense, and that's Kalen Black. Um, running back there. The running back, I'm pretty high on him. I think he he is their best running back. Um, if I'm if I'm picking a piece of the offense, that's the one I'm, I'm picking. I mean, I, I dropped um, – <laughs> I, I dropped Reggie Brown last week for uh, for uh, Ashlock. So there you go. Okay, well, that's all right. Um, well, I mean, this was last week, right before Ashlock did anything, but I just, I was thinking like I needed to drop somebody and I was like, you know, it's a dynasty league, Reggie Brown's, you know, last year, I don't know that the quarterback situation that he's going to be, I don't know that he's going to be able to produce like Chris Thornton. Um, and so I dropped Reggie Brown to to pick up Ashlock. So, you know, hindsight's great. That looked great right now, but you know, maybe we'll, we'll see. All right, Justice, what do you think about this new uh, offense here for ODU? Um, as a fan, I'm super excited. Um, from a fantasy standpoint, I feel like um, some people's expectations are not super realistic. I think um, it's probably a year early. Um, but having said that, you know, the fan in me, like, I hope, like, it's just lights out dynamite from, from day one. Um, my concerns are that, one, the, the, the overall talent level at Old Dominion is not great. Um, just from a, you, I mean, it usually takes a, a coach about a year to get their players in, too. So. The, the other thing is the schedule is super tough. Um, you know, it's a tough out-of-conference schedule. They play Wake Forest. They play Virginia Tech. Um uh, Liberty, I think, uh, and then they get the FCS gimme game against Texas A&M Commerce, and then the Sun Belt East is like no joke. 
Um, I always refer to the Sun Belt East as the uh, the SEC uh, West of the G5. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just think that, you know, people's expectations are a little bit higher than I think they should be. Like my personal expectation is that they're kind of like Colorado State of last year um, where you kind of maybe see some flashes, right? Um, but they're, or even Hawaii of last year, right. Where, you know, they have some okay games, but nothing like, nothing like too crazy. Um, but having said that, you know, I've drafted my fair share of, of, of players. Um, you know, I've drafted Grant Wilson, the starting quarterback. I've drafted the freshman quarterback, Colton Joseph. Um, Colton Joseph has been running with the twos. Um, the, what I've heard is that, Colton Joseph like looks phenomenal and you know it, it, it basically and then Grant Wilson did too in fall camp they both looked great in fall camp um but that Wilson was you know got the edge for the experience um and so they didn't really not only him. the experience but experience in this in the system right he, he he transferred over with with the with the, the new um OC Kevin and Decker so, yep Kevin Decker came over from Fordham um, and that, and, and, uh, Grant Wilson was the QB two last year for Fordham. And so, you know, they, they didn't want to march into Blacksburg playing Virginia tech game one with a true freshman quarterback. So I am, you know, I try not to get too excited about Joseph, right? Because his competition was Jack Shields, uh, Jack Shields, great, great kid. Uh, he was a preferred walk on, um, up until the spring and then he, he got a scholarship at the end of spring and so you know i'm not super shocked that and, and also the word was that shields had an injury in fall camp and so that gave uh, joseph uh, more reps and so i'm not super shocked that joseph passed shields um but i am encouraged that he looked so good as a true freshman um and maybe you know who knows right there was last time i kind of heard this buzz about true freshman quarterback there's this uh, little scrawny kid from Georgia named Taylor Heineke. And, um, you know, the rest of that story is kind of history there. Uh, but, you know, I'm not saying Colton Joseph is the next Taylor Heineke. But, you know, hey, as an ODU fan, we can certainly hope for that. Uh, so, I think so if, if people aren't familiar with Kevin Decker and, and why, you know, they're talking up ODU and – and really hoping that of this breakout that Justice is talking about. Um, so he's been at the Brown Bears, FCS, and then uh, Fordham Rams, FCS. But during his time there, which has been a total of four years, they averaged 30.61 points and 37 passes per game. So that's a pretty insane volume yeah. there. Um, and yeah, his last year, last year three 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 high end receivers, and last year they averaged forty nine point five points and forty two uh, pass attempts per game. Yep. So and then like I said, you've got Grant Wilson coming in, who's you don't have to worry about him learning that offense. He sat he sat there and learned that offense. So given that. Um, th- Decker's quarterbacks over his four years has averaged 25.96 points per game. So, again, pr- pretty good step uh, points per game there. If you're looking for a piece of this offense, I think the number one guy, that, number one guy, and the guy, a guy that I'm pretty high on, I think I might even have him ranked like 20th or inside my just inside my top 20 for wide receivers is Javon Harvey. Um, I fully expect him to be the wide receiver one here. Um, and he seems to be going fairly late or, or, or later. It really depends on who you're in drafts with. There are certain individuals um, that will draft him super high. Um, and then sometimes you can get him late. Um, you just kind of had, you had to, you had to know, you had to know who you were in the draft with to know when to, when to draft Mr. Harvey. Um, fortunately, I was able to get him in a, a lot of the leagues I was in, um, through supplemental drafts or, or redrafts. Um, if you're looking for who that secondary receiver is, um, my gut tells me Amari and Granger, but you know, there's been very positive reports coming out of fall camp 
about Jordan Bly. Jordan Bly is the son of Dre Bly, former former uh, Detroit Lion, North Carolina Tar Heel cornerback. Um, and so, you know, those two guys, two guys to kind of keep an eye on, both Amari and Granger and and uh, Jordan Bly, and then the running back room. So they got a, a transfer that came from, over from JUCO, who was formerly at, at University of Alabama. Pretty sure at Alabama he was playing uh, defensive back. He went to JUCO, was playing running back. He's going to play running back for uh, Old Dominion, and that's Kadarius Callaway. Um, coming out of the spring, the word was that Callaway was third on the depth chart, that Kashawn Wicks was number one, Tariq Sims was number two. Um, and, like, when I, when I heard that and saw that, like, my immediate expectation was, well, he's very likely going to pass Sims um, in fall camp. And it looks like um, he has passed Wicks as well. Now, I want to say it was last week, Ricky Ronnie had come out and said, hey, it's going to be running back by committee. But I do believe Callaway is probably the most talented running back. And so I wouldn't, you know, maybe they start off with the intention of being running back by committee. But as the year progresses, Callaway kind of pulls away and is the man. Um, and Callaway – um, unless you're in a league with me or with uh, Clint Carlson, he, he's pretty much going undrafted. So, um, yeah, someone to definitely look at in deeper leagues. Um, talking about some trends, going back to the wide receivers, uh, wide receiver ones in this offense average 16.45 points per game. The wide receiver twos average 14.89 points per game, and wide, res- wide receiver threes average 12 points per game. So, yeah, so all, all can be productive, and those are those would be your three: Harvey, Granger, and Bly. So maybe Isaiah Page, but and then I think we're all excited, you know, talking about George Halani versus Ashton Genty, and what that looks like. Uh, I've seen a lot of reports about Genty being, you know, doing pass routes, working out of the slot, being in a PPR league. That is super exciting. Um, they, they need to get him, you know, touches in open space, right? He's electric. So, really excited there. Um, I believe they play Wa- Washington. I'm trying to remember who it is. Is it Washington? Oh, I've. It's like a lost justice. Well, so that's uh, something to look forward to is um, what that offense looks like. You got Taylor Green there. Uh, obviously, a running quarterback definitely helps move uh, the line of scrimmage, uh, make some holes there for the running game. Another thing we're looking at is the Fresno State offense. Um, you've got the Offensive coordinator, I cannot remember his name off the top of my head, but he, he moves over to uh, Missouri. So what does this Fresno State offense look like? It shouldn't change too much, um, in my opinion. So kind of looking at that quarterback, running back, wide receiver group, um, and then definitely excited to see what this UNLV new go-go offense looks like and uh, see if we want any pieces of this offense. But that is all the things that we are looking forward to here in week one. Um, Next week we'll be going full bore with that sweet, sweet nectar on the G5 week one games and bringing you all the news for the swarm that we can find concerning the g5 so thanks for the support please like subscribe retweet leave five star review etc um this will be available on youtube spotify apple Podcasts, and google podcasts going forward so thank you and good night